And we're on the air. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Code Mentor Office Hours. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, we have another exciting episode for you today. Today, we're jumping into Reactive, something that we haven't uh, talked about, I think, since uh, since I joined Office Hours. Um, but we're really excited today to uh, have uh, Martin Gontavnikas with us. Um, I'm going to give Martin a little introduction, and uh, he's going to give us a presentation. If, if it's your first time doing office hours with us, um, if you're in the room here, which it looks like there's a couple more spots available, if anyone's watching the broadcast wants to join the, join the live room, um, there's a group chat. You can throw questions in. And then if you're in the live broadcast, um, there should be a Q&A app you can use, and I'll be checking questions um, there. And uh, we'll hit Q&A at the end, and, and uh, just feel free to th throw them in as you think of it. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll hit as many as we can. So without further ado, um, uh, Martin Gonsavnikas has been in tech since he was 12 years old. Uh, now he's a web developer, trainer, speaker, and writer. He currently works as a developer advocate at Otho. Uh, he's a big advocate and contributor to open source software. He's built uh, RustAngular, Angular Itix, uh, fantastic name by the way, uh, Factory <laughs> Pal, Angular JWT, and many more. Uh, he blogs over at uh, gone.2 slash blog um, and has spoken at Devox, NG Europe, and .js, among others. Um, he's joining us today to discuss reactive programming, uh, what that really means, and we'll dive into some practical examples of how uh, software like Netflix uh, leverages reactive programming to make performant, scalable, and loosely coupled apps. So uh, while everyone's on mute, please welcome Martin, and uh, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Hey guys, how are you? Um, I'll first share my screen. Let me know if you can see it so that we can start. Let me know when you are seeing the screen. I can see it. Awesome, okay. So as Mark was saying, uh, the idea today is that I will explain to you a little bit about reactive programming, functional programming, uh, streams, observables, and all things like that. Um, this is a talk that I did at uh, ng-conf uh, a few weeks back. I did it with Ben Lesh. He works at Netflix. Now, today he couldn't join, but I do know about what he's working on at Netflix, and I'll, do, I'll, I'll give also some examples about Netflix. So, sorry, it was the wrong presentation. Now we can start. So. As I was saying, um, my name is Martin Gontovnikas. Um, my Twitter handle is mgonto. If you guys want to follow me to learn about technology, AngularJS, reactive programming, and things like that. Um, I am a software developer based uh, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I'm working at OutZero. Um, OutZero is basically a SaaS that helps you with authentication and authorization. Uh, you first pick an SDK, it could be AngularJS, Node.js, React, iOS, whatever technology, new technology exists with an SDK. And after picking up that, that SDK, you just hook it to your app or API, and you get authentication working with social providers like Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn, um, regular username and passwords, or also enterprise connections like Active Directory, uh, Windows Azure ID, LDAP, and so on. I used to be working there uh, coding JavaScript all day long. So basically, this was me. I was hammering the keyboard, coding, etc. But now I'm working as a developer advocate, which means that I'm doing talks like this one, trying to do blog posts, samples, prototypes, and things like that. So before starting uh, with the talk, I wanted to mention just one more thing. But if you guys want to try out OutZero, it's free, and uh, you can just go to outsega.com slash sign up, and you can try it out there. Without further interaction, let's start with the talk, and today we're going to talk about re using reactive programming in the front end. Something important to mention before starting is that this talk is not about functional reactive programming. So we will be learning about functional programming, we will be learning why uh, going functional makes sense and why it makes sense. We we'll also learn a little bit about reactive programming, what it means, what observables are, what streams are, but we are not learning about FRP. If I would say that we are learning about functional reactive programming, somebody, somebody who knows Haskell or something like that would jump at my sugar and eat it basically because he would like, no, no, you're not teaching that. 
So this is what you're going to be learning um, today. So the first thing that many people ask is, why should we go functional? Why should we use functional programming? So I know that I have like a nice familiar imperative code. Let's see this example. It's basically a function that returns odd numbers. If, if you can read the function, the idea is that it basically receives an array of numbers. Based on that, first it creates a results array, and then it iterates over all the numbers that it received as a parameter. And for each of them, it checks if it's odd. And if it's odd, it adds that number plus some exclamation marks to the results object. That means that the result object is mutating on every iteration. So each time that I have a new number that is odd, that result will mutate and get a new value. And then I return the results. This works perfectly in JavaScript because JavaScript is basically single threading. There's just one thread. There's no concurrency. There's nothing else. So it works perfectly. And also, another thing that we need to mention about this is that JavaScript, as you know it right now, is actually going to change. So in the past, cores were getting faster and faster every day. So imagine I was coding a JavaScript application in the browser, and it wasn't performant enough. If I wanted to make it performant, I could just wait three months. Because if I waited three months, that means that the, that the core would get from one gigahertz to two gigahertz, and boom, that's it. Now my app is like really performant. Now we can't, we can't do that, because now cores aren't getting much faster. What's happening now is that people are starting to build processors with multiple cores. So we're starting to have like two, three, four cores, which are at the same speed. And the idea is that we can, we can make our applications work between all those different cores. And what that means is that if JavaScript wants to continue working and being performant, it needs to work with concurrency. And that means that real concurrency is coming to JavaScript. When I said it uh, in the conference, everybody was looking like here in the GIF, like, what? Are you talking to me? So it's not just yet, but trust me, it will. And why learning functional programming makes sense if we're going to have um, concurrent JavaScript? Well, because the thing is that functional programming aligns with parallelism. Why is that? Because two of its biggest pillars are, first, immutable state. Immutable state means that states of the objects and values don't change. We always create a new one, and nothing changes. The good thing about that is that if we have like two different threads, and one needs to read something, and one needs to write something, if they are mutating that something, they have to synchronize. And having to synchronize is a lot of work for multi-threading environments. And we might have a race condition where we don't know if something happens first on the other, then we have a problem, and we don't know which one is first. If state is immutable, we will never have that problem, because nothing matters at that point regarding state, because it doesn't change. The other important thing is that there are no side effects in functional programming. That's not entirely true. The truth is that there are side effects, but they are scoped and controlled. And side effects means that, what does it mean? That if I call a function with value x, I will get a value y as a return always. That means that there are no side effects. And that means that I know that every time I call a function, how it will return. If I know that, it's much easier to cuddle concurrency and to cuddle how things will work, because it doesn't matter how many threads are calling that function it will always return the same thing. What that means is that the work could easily be scaled across threads if I'm doing functional programming. So how can we do that today? Well, Array has a lot of methods that are functional already in JavaScript, like map, filter, reduce. And there are more methods if we want to, do, to use it with ECMAS, oh, sorry, with ECMAScript 6, yeah, and also with Lodash or underscore. So let's implement the same function as before, which basically returns all the odd numbers. So in this case, what we're doing is, first, we're receiving the numbers array. And then we're just calling on filter. And we're saying that we're going to filter everything that is odd. 
So what this is doing is it's iterating over all the elements of the nums array. It's checking whether it's odd or not. And if it's odd, then it's adding it to a new array. So that means that the output of calling filter will be a new array. Then, once I have that new array with only odd numbers, I will call map, which will transform each of those values and just add the exclamation marks. What that means is that in this case, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not having a results object that is mutating. I'm actually getting intermediary arrays. I'm creating one new array, an immutable array, because it doesn't change then, with all the different steps and transformations that I want. And I'm iterating over that array every time. And this just works. And this is much easier to work and control in a multi-threading environment. However, um, working at Netflix, actually Ben found a problem with this approach. So let me first tell you about the application that he was building so that you can see why it was the problem. The application is called Argus. It's basically a real-time dashboard for Netflix Cloud. What it means is that it had like dozens and dozens of graphs uh, showing information about requests, what movies people were seeing, what was happening, what was going on, and all of that worked real time with web, web sockets. So the dashboard was connected to all the users to get all the information. And it also had a lot of user rich interactions like, I don't know, uh, zooming, the graphics could, you could point, click on a point and things like that. So we can see it live here now, where we see that we have a graphic that is moving in real time, and also that we can zoom, we have an X, there are like lots of interactions and scrolling, etc. So this is an Ember app. So what happened? Um, it was time to do the first big demo of Argus. Everybody was feeling like really, really confident because they created reusable and composable graphics. Um, they also got all the mouse interactions working, and they worked for real time with really, really, really big test data. So they were sure that it was going to work. But this is what happened uh, the production day. Basically, boom, it didn't work. And the question is why it didn't work. And the problem was that it was using too much array map filter and reduce, what we saw just recently. And what was the problem with that? As I was saying before, imagine that we have three operations. Like we have an array and we do first the filter, then a map, and then another map. Each time that we do one of those operations, we'll iterate over all the array. So the filter, the map, the map, that's that we'll iterate over the array three times. And also, each of those calls, the map and the filter and the filter, um, they will return a new array. So that means that I'm having a lot of intermediary arrays that I actually don't care about because all I care about was the end result. And that means that first, I have a lot of memory being used because I have a lot of intermediary and immutable arrays being created. Also, I'm doing a lot of processing because I'm iterating over the entire array every step, every time again. And those intermediary arrays, as they are not being used anymore, they need to be garbage collected. And garbage collection takes time as well. And that, all that made it boom. It didn't work. At that point, they realized that what they needed was stream processing. Why is that? What is stream processing? Yeah, it's basically the same. I will still have my map filter map transformations. But the thing is that instead of returning a new array on every step and doing a, an iteration over all of the items, what it, what it is doing is it's applying all the transformations to each item. So basically, we start for the, with the first item, we run further the filter, we run down the map, we then run the map, and then we got an output, and we add it to a final array. And the same for the second value, the third value, and so on. That means that I only have the beginning array and the ending array. And besides that, I'm only iterating over the array or over the collection once. So that sounded like it could be a solution. And in order to do stream processing, we can use reactive extensions, RxJS, observables. So let's see how. The good thing about observables is that their API is pretty, pretty similar to array. So if we were doing array.filter and then .map, it's now observables.filter.map. Even though the semantics is the same, 
we should know that uh, what's going on behind the hood is not the same. Now we are only having one iteration and we are applying the transformations to each of those items. So a question now that we notice is what else can observables do? So the important thing is that observables are a representation of any collection of values over any amount of time. What does that mean? Imagine an array. An array is a collection of any values, string, ints, at an instant time, because I'm creating it like right now. However, for example, clicking on a button can also be an observable. Why is that? Because it's a collection of values, it's a collection of click events over an amount of time, because maybe I first click it right now, then I click it again in like one second, then I click it again in three seconds. So an observable can be that as well. Another important thing is that observables can be merged, concatenated, and zipped like any other collection. So if you're familiar with Lodash or Underscore, all of the methods that you can do there with collections can also be done with observables. So in reality, observables are a pattern that lets you first set up a data stream and start it, then emit at any point of time 0 to n messages, so 0 to n values. It could be all instant ones, like an array, or one every like one second or two seconds. And then you tear down the data stream. So you stop that data, you stop that data stream and you run something uh, in, the, in the stopping moment, let's say. So what are then the different data streams? We've mentioned some of them, but it could be an array of data, it could be a mouse and keyboard interaction, DOM events, network I.O., animations, speech recognition, joystick input, well, anything really. It can be anything that is a set of values at any amount of time, which is cool because we can represent a lot of things with observables. So going back to Netflix, not only it solved the problem with uh, Argus exploding because of the memory and processing problem, it also solved another problem, which is that sockets die. What does it mean that sockets die? Well, remember that Argus was a real-time application. That means that it was getting information through web sockets, real-time information. And whenever you lose the laptop lead or, or there's a glitch in the network connectivity or anything like that, well, we kind of lose that web socket. And that was a problem for Netflix because whenever the socket was uh, connected, they needed to send a subscription message to say to which topics they wanted to subscribe. Then they just wanted to get the data, and then once they got the data, just send an unsubscription and then close the sockets. So that means that if the connection was lost, the laptop was closed, and then I open it back again, I have to check that socket and then again send a subscription message and get all the messages and then tear it down. So that would mean to maintain a lot of state on that. And maintaining state is not that easy. So how did they solve that? Basically with two observables. The first one is like a very simple and basic observable, which is a socket observable. The basic idea of it is that in the start uh, period, it basically connects uh, to a socket. Then it emits all the messages that arrive on that socket, and if there's an error on the socket, like a disconnection or anything like that, that would error the observable, and then it would disconnect the socket on disposal of the observable. And the important thing is that they created this multiplex data observable on top of the socket. And the idea was that when it was being created, when this observable was being created, it first sent the, the subscription request through the socket. Then it got only the pertinent messages, and then uh, after disposal, it sent the unsubscribe message. And the nice thing about that is that now that it's modeled with observables, observables can retry. So this is pseudocode, but the important part is the retry and retry when. So what's going on here is that first it's sending the subscription message. Then it's getting all the different data that gets from the socket and then it's sending the unsubscription. So imagine that we're sending first the subscription message, we get the first two data messages, and then boom, the guy closes his laptop lid. And then he opens it back. When he opens it back, we need to reconnect to that socket. And with this retry, it just works. 
because closing the lid m m meant that the socket closed abruptly. That is an error in the observable. When there's an error in the observable, this retry operator just retries everything. So it will again send the subscription message, it will again get all the data, and then it will again do the unsubscribe. And if it fails again, it will try again. There's another method, there's another operator for observables called uh, retry when, which lets you basically retry for more complex conditions uh, than just a number. But the basic idea is the same, that since I have this flow with observables and it errors, I can handle that error, which is pretty nice. So a fair warning uh, about RxJS. The first thing is that it has a decent learning curve. It's pretty hard to learn it because you need to change the way you think about problems because when you model observables, it's, it's, it's completely different to how you model imperative code. You're doing both reactive programming and functional programming at the same time. Also, there are a lot of operators to learn. Operators are like map, uh, flat map, flat map latest, retry, and a lot of them. Actually, I, I don't even remember all of them. Them. I usually end up like Googling for them. And a lot of time happened to me that I needed something to be done on observable. I needed kind of like some operator and I didn't know it existed, so I built my own and then I realized, fuck, it already existed, so why did I build it? But that happens a lot when you're learning. And the other thing about observables is that sometimes they're a sync, sometimes they're a sync. Because they're like some of them are like at a, at a, at a instant moment and some are not. And that's something to take into account when we're thinking about it. So what is reactive programming then? If I have a value uh, named C, that C depends in, in regular code, in imperative programming, that value C depends, is coupled, depends on A and B. And then whatever I want to use C, I have to know exactly what A and B are and how they work, because otherwise I won't be able to use it. When I'm doing reactive programming, I will have a C string. And that C stream is actually a combination of the A stream and the B stream. And now once I have this C stream created, then I don't have to know anymore what A and B are, because it's completely decoupled, because it's a new observable. So another cool thing is that Angular 2.x, the new version of AngularJS, will have observables, and they will be first class citizen. Observables will be everywhere, which is something that maybe uh, makes us also learn this. Not only that, but also the TC39 um, is analyzing adding observables as, uh, as, some, as some standard um, in JavaScript and in the browser. So just like we have promises now if we go to the Chrome developer tools, we would be able to write observable and it would work. So that means that it will be native thing. And even though it's, it's still in discussion, I'm pretty sure it will actually happen. So now that we know this, is the question is, how can we use this today? How can we do it today? So for that, we can use RxJS, which are reactive extensions for JavaScript. RxJS was uh, created by Microsoft, actually. Um, Eric Meyer works there, who is a genius with reactive programming and functional programming. He's like one of the first people who are working on this, and he created he, he, uh, RxJS there. And, well, in this case, we'll use the Angular toolkit, but if you're not using Angular and you're listening to me right now, the code is, like, pretty much the same. The ideas are the same. It's just the implementation that will change in this case. So let's start simple. Let's start with a really simple example. Let's imagine a counter. -off. Let's say we have this button, which is just every time I click it, the counter increases. What you can see is that every time that I click it, the counter increases a different amount. And that's because, in this case, we're calling a server to know uh, the number that we need to increase this counter. So let's see how to implement it first, in, in, how, how we would implement it right now. We would have uh, an input type button, which and we would add there an ng click, so that every time that this button is clicked, we will call this increase counter function. And then we have like a span, which just displays the counter value at the current moment. And that's it. How would we code it right now in AngularJS? We would have this increase counter function, and what it would do is, first, it will call the server uh, to get the amount to sum. That will return a promise. I would get the new count. Then, in this case, I'm, I'm really interested in logging the count that I just got. So I, I am, again, 
calling the server to log that count. And then once I have uh, the, 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 the count working, then I just update the counter in my scope so that the span will display it. So how do we do this same thing with Rx? First thing, of course, we need to add the dependency upon the module Rx. Once we do that, now our scope will have this new function called $CreateObservable function. And what this will do is it will create a stream of clicks. So this function will now return a stream of clicks, which means that we'll have an infinite list of clicks. It's a list which starts empty, but throughout time, we will start getting new values. So maybe it starts empty, then one second later, we get the first click. Two seconds later, we get the another click. Three seconds later, we get another click. So now we have an infinite list where clicks keep on appearing. And once we have that, it's just, as I was mentioning before, it's a set of transformations that will apply to each of those values. So the first thing that I'm doing is I'm converting each of those clicks into a counter amount, which I get from the server. So I had click, click, click. Now I have one, two, three. Because I converted those three clicks that I got through time to values and numbers. Then I need to log the counter to log this counter to the server. This log counter function returns nothing. If a function returns nothing, usually it's because it has side effects. So another nice thing about observables is that we can just isolate the part where we have a side effect and just call this do. This do will run that function for every value that shows up in the observable, uh, log it in the server, and then return the same thing that was there before. So that for the observable itself, it's like this line doesn't exist. <coughs> Sorry. Then we're doing this scan. This scan is basically a sum. We're saying that every time that we get a new value, we're adding that value to the accumulated amount that we had before. So let's go again when, on what we have had. So we had a click, click, click. In second one, two, and three. Then we converted those values, uh, those, those clicks, to counter values. So one, two, three. And now for each time we get it, that value, we're actually summing it to, the, to, to an accumulator of what we got before. So the first one, it, it didn't have anything accumulated before, so it will be just one. The second one, now, now we got a two, but there was a one before, so two plus one is three. And the last one, it's the three. Three plus the three I had before was six. So I went from click, 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 to one, two, three, to one, three, six. Now, at this point, I care about the values that come out of the observables. At this point of the transformation chain, it's the point where I care about what's going on. And this is what converts a stream into an observable, because a stream is just an infinite list. An observable is an infinite list in which I can subscribe, in which I can observe at a certain point in time what's going on. In this case, I'm observing, I'm not subscribing, and each time that, this, that there's a new value in the observable, I just set it in the counter so that I can update the span. Another nice thing about it is that I can handle errors in here. And all the, if there's any error at any step through the transformation chain, so if the flat map fails, if the do fails, if the scan fails, I can handle all of those errors in here. Then another thing that we always need to do that sometimes we forget, I, I, to be honest, I, I forget pretty often about it, and it leads to memory leaks, is that once I don't need this observable anymore because the user has moved to another page, I need to dispose this observable because otherwise it will still exist and it will still consume memory. So that means that in Angular at least, when the page is being removed, you, you have this event called dollar destroy, and in there we just dispose the observable. And that's it. So this was my expression when I got when, when, when I saw this. I was like, whoa, this seems cool, but it's also kind of complicated. So I actually had to learn and read more to understand it. So for me, I always understand with graphics. So let's see how this works. So first we receive a click or a circle in this case. Then we just transform it into a counter or a diamond in this case. 
and then we transform that counter diamond into a sum. That is for the first click. Then, at some later point in time, maybe like in three seconds, in four seconds, I get another click. And that click will go again through all the transformation chain. So that means that if I look through time, if I look not just one instant, but if I look around time, for example, 10 seconds, and I know that in those 10 seconds there were four clicks, those four clicks will be converted to four counters, and then they will com be converted to four sums. In this case, it's circles converted to diamonds, converted to squares. But the idea is the same. And now it was like, yay, I got it. I finally understood how observables worked. And once I understood that, I was like, yeah, clicking on counter are actually very few events. It's kind of easy to do. So now I wasn't excited anymore. It wasn't that cool. It wasn't like really nice to do it. So let's actually try with more events. Let's try something more complicated. So my boss asked me to write a feature, which is to have a text that says try out zero for free, and then at every time that I move the mouse, that try out zero for free text moves. Well, of course, this is not a real, a real feature that he asked me. Nobody would ask for this. But this is a nice example, because moving the mouse generates a lot of events. And if I move it quick, you will see that the letters still follow me very quick. And then if I stop, they will move, they will move there. Something important to note for the example, since we'll, 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 we'll actually notice that, is that when I move the mouse, sorry, when I move the mouse, the letters don't move all at the same time. They move one at a time. And they actually move 100 milliseconds after the other. So let's learn how we can implement this. First, we have this uh, moving text directive or component. Basically, we're saying here that we're creating a component, and the text for that component will be try out zero for free. Um, this is like the Angular part, which is basically that this component will be an element. It will be replaced by some template, and it will receive um, a text as a parameter, which will be the one to, to show. So how, how, how is the template? How does the template work? Basically, the main div, we have this ng mouse move event. What happens? Sorry. It's all good. Sorry, someone else came in and was loud, so I just muted them. You can go ahead. Ah, uh, okay, no problem. Thanks. So, what, what's what, what's going on here? First, the first thing I'm having is in the main div. I'm having I'm having this ng mouse move, which will basically just call this mouse move function every time that somebody moves the mouse. And then inside there, I have this div, which is just a text container, and inside there we'll have one span for each letter. So if the phrase is try out zero for free, we will have one span for the T, one for the R, one for the Y, and so on. And in here, what we're doing with this ng style is actually absolutely position um, this element by setting some top and left. So let's see how to implement it now. The first thing, again, similar to before, we're creating this dollar scope dot dollar create observable function. This will create a stream, an infinite list of mouse move events. Then what I'm doing is I'm converting those mouse move events into offsets or deltas. What does it mean? So I, I have the mouse up, up here and the text, imagine that the text is like right near this. Let's actually go back a little bit so that I can show it. So I have the mouse here and the text is right near to it. As soon as I move the mouse, in that precise second, the text will be in a different position to where the mouse is. And what I'm doing in this first step is actually calculating the offset, so the difference in space, from where the mouse has just moved and where the text is. Once I have that, the thing is that I want to move each letter at a time. And what I calculated above is the offset between the mouse and all the text. So now what I'm doing is I'm mapping over the text so that I, so that I can get um, one element in this observable per letter. So I had first one mouse move. I converted that to one offset. And then from each of those offsets, I'm creating one new value in the observable for each of the letters that are in the world. 
So now we will have one value in this observable for the T, one for the R, one for the Y, and so on. And what I'm returning here is, the, is which letter I'm getting, so the T, for example. I'm, I'm returning the delta that I got, which is the difference between where the mouse uh, is and where the text is, and then the index of this letter. Now that we have this, we can use this operator from observable called timer. As I was saying before, an observable is basically an infinite list where values can keep on arriving, and they can arrive at any time. So what I'm doing here is, now I have in, in, in the observable that I have here up to this uh, step in the transformation chain, I have one value per letter. What I want now is to actually output each of those values at a different point in time, because I want to move the first letter around 100 milliseconds, the third one in 200 milliseconds, and so on. So what that means is that what I'm doing here is I'm using this observable timer to actually output the value in index, uh, index time 100 milliseconds later on. So for letter one, it will be right now. For letter one, it will output a value in 100 milliseconds. For letter two, it will output a value in 200 milliseconds. And at that point, I'm unsubscribing. Because now I have an observable in which every time I move the mouse, I will get a value for the T right now. In 100 milliseconds, I will get a value. 200 milliseconds, I will get a value for a Y. And each of those will have the delta. So what I'm doing here is just setting at the top and left um, into the letters so that they can be moved. And again, the same as before, um, once this page is, is moved to another one, we need to dispose this observable. So now I was happy because this was a lot of events. And it, this observable that we just created is actually a pretty complicated one. But it's much simpler than we, if we would have to implement this just by us. It, it's much, much simpler. So the nice, the nice thing is that this is just the beginning. Because observables, as I said, are going to be everywhere. T 39 will standardize it, and they will be everywhere. So from now on, you can start working with observables. And not only in JavaScript. I mean, there are observables are first class citizen in Scala. There's a library for Java, which was actually done by Netflix. And there are libraries for most of the languages um, for reactive and functional programming. So what I propose to you is just to react to everything. So this is the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. And now we can actually go to some questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Martin. That was great. Um, uh, by far the uh, most animated images that we've had in any present office hours. Um, so uh, yeah, guys, go ahead and uh, throw in any, any questions you have into the chat or q and I can start with some that were sent in. Um, or actually, uh, Kenrick, uh, who's in the room with us, sent one in uh, just a, a little while ago. Um, is scan like a reduce on the collection? Um, yeah. Make, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that makes sense. So there's also a reduce in the observable, but scan is actually pretty similar to the reduce. The difference is that you have to think it differently because in the reduce, what you're doing is you're always going through the elements that you already got, but in the scan, you're going through the elements that you got so far, and then at, at, at another future point in time, you will get your new values. And for each of them, you keep on. So yeah, it's kind of it's, it's an alias for reduce for observables. Awesome. Um, hopefully that was helpful, uh, Kenrick. Let, let us know if you have any follow-up questions. Um, so one thing, uh, it's coming through the Q&A app from the other broadcast. So I know you, you talked about the relationship a little bit at the beginning, but can you, can you go a little bit more in depth in the relationship between reactive programming and functional reactive programming? I think some people need some clarification there. Yeah, sure. So functional programming, the idea of functional programming is that functions are first class citizen. And the important part of, uh, of that is like is immutable state and no side effect, among other things. Those are like the most important parts of functional programming. Then we have another part, which is um, reactive programming, which is basically having observables, um, streams, and things like that. And then 
functional reactive programming is like a completely different thing because it actually has a lot of things having to do with monoids, monads, and things like that, which are more complex, and I actually don't even know all of them. That's why I didn't want to talk about that. So even though we are learning about functional programming and reactive programming separately, it's not the same as having like FRP together. That, that was on, only the, the, the warning that I did in the beginning. Gotcha. Um, so I mean, so if you were sort of at the onset of a project, you know, what would be the variables or indicators that would make you go in one direction or the other between those two? So basically, if, I, I mean, right now I would use reactive programming and observables anywhere that I can because I think it's like kind of an evolution of what functional programming is. And also, if you know functional programming, as I was showing, if you know how to use the map, the filter, the reduce, and so on. It's mostly the same thing with observables. The only thing is that you have to think about that everything is now async and it happens at some point in time and not right now. But I think that as a first step, we can start with functional programming. And using functional programming at least, now we are pretty, the only problem that we can have using functional programming is the same as Netflix had, which is basically, if you're doing a lot of transformations, and a lot of them, that will mean that we'll end up creating lots and lots and lots of arrays, we'll have lots of uh, iteration over everything, and that will mean that we will have a lot of performance problems. So if it's a small app, we can still do functional programming, and we'll have no problem at all. But if it's a real big app with lots of transformations, in that case, I would suggest using uh, observables and reactive programming. Cool, that makes sense. Um, people are being a little shy, but I can I can throw some more questions in. Um, uh, I mean, what, what would you recommend is a good place to start um, if you're if you want to just if you're just beginning your journey into trying out Reactive? Um, you know, assuming you know a little bit of uh, another language. Oh, now some questions are coming in. But yeah, yeah, yeah. What what would you recommend for sort of beginners for Reactive? So for beginners for Reactive, I think the best thing to do is to follow, there's a Coursera course for Reactive Programming, which is actually done by Martino Dersky, who is the creator of Scala, and Scala is one of the first languages to embrace observables and Reactive Programming as first class citizens. And it's also done by Eric Meyer, who is the one that created this RxJS library. So I would definitely recommend doing the Coursera course. I can actually link it here, I, I can move it. But it's the reactive programming course on Coursera. It's it's approximately like 20 hours of videos, but also you have exercises which you can do, and you will be able to know how much you're understanding. There are forums, talk to people, etc. That would be a good, a very good way to start. Then there's also a reactive manifesto.com page, which is basically it's a longer and bigger and more theoretical explanation of why reactive makes sense. And then finally, if you do like uh, white papers, I know a lot of people don't, but there's a white paper um, by Odersky also, which shows you how you can transform your applications from like regular event handling, from like mouse clicks, to a reactive way of event handling, and why it makes sense to do that. It's like really technical and really deep, so it's kind of hard to read. So I, I would suggest to do the course records, but if you like white papers, then that's another one that would make sense. Awesome. Yeah, maybe we can, um, even after the session, I can get some of those links. I can email those out to everyone. Um, yeah, Kenrick actually just asked for some other books, papers, essays. So we'll send all that stuff out. Um, Shatan, I uh, was just curious, uh, for a real-time graph and more data, would you re recommend React? I, can you hear me? I, I kind of lost you. Oh, um, I was just uh, reading uh, someone's question. Um, someone was curious, for a real-time graph and more data, uh, would you recommend React? So React, even though it's name, it's not really reactive. Right. So the, the idea of, of, of React, uh, the React, I don't know if you meant React from Facebook, which I, I think you do. The idea of React uh, is like, that you can have components and you have like the virtual DOM and the diffing so that every time that there's a change, it does the, the diffing on the, it, it does the change in the virtual DOM 
it then does a diff between the virtual DOM and the real DOM, and it only does those changes. So that will be a little bit more performance, but whatever library you use, either React, Ember.js, or AngularJS, you can, for all of them, use observables, and whichever you use, if you use observables, it will be much more Martin, are you still there? Martin, can you hear me? I, I lost you. Uh, you can use observables with any of them. Oh, awesome. Oh, can you can you still hear me? I, I lost you for a second. Yeah, I, yeah, I can. Okay. All right. Sorry. Google Hangouts. Um, yeah, we've been we've been doing a big office hour series covering all sorts of JavaScript stuff. So Ember and React and Backbone and basically it sounds like observables are complementary to all that, not instead of. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Um, yeah, guys, throw in uh, some other questions if you have them. Um, looks like some people had to step out, but if I, I didn't mention it, this is all also going to be live recorded to the Code Mentor YouTube channel, um, so uh, please feel free to go and, and review a lot of what Martin went over if, if this is uh, probably, it's probably a heavy amount of new information. Um, Shatan, uh, could you please share the links to video chat? Yeah, I'll, I'll send out all the links um, in an email in the next 24 hours. Um, I'll, I'll get copies of those links from Martin, so we don't have to worry about writing those down now. Um, but uh, Martin, yeah, wh where else can people uh, follow your work? Uh, you mentioned your company and your, your Twitter handle. Are, are you doing any blogging about Reactive or anything like that? So I'm actually I'm writing enough right now the blog uh, post about this same talk and some other things. So I do blog in, 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 in my blog, but not right now. I don't have anything in particular to Reactive programming. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, people are probably definitely curious to dig into more into the links that you mentioned and stuff like that. So, um, you know, if yeah. there aren't any other questions, you know, we can we can wrap up. I uh, definitely don't want to take up too much more of Martin's time. But, um, gosh, Martin, thank you so much. That was a really awesome presentation. And uh, like I said, guys, please go back to the YouTube version and, and rewatch this to really learn this stuff. Um, we also do have some excellent uh, – reactive uh, specialists on Code Mentor, so we're always at your disposal, obviously, if you're working on anything and, and need any help there. Um, but uh, if there's nothing else, uh, we can we can wrap up, and, and like I said, I'll, I'll share all those links out to everybody. So um, uh, good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you find yourself <laughs> in the world. And uh, uh, check out um, some more Code Mentor office hours coming up. We have a whole series we're in the middle of that's really, really awesome. Um, doesn't look like there's any other questions popping up, so I think we, we might be all set for now. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Thanks, Code Mentor and Mark, for having me, and I'll send you the links shortly. Awesome. All right, take care.